Tarzan of the Apes, brought to you from out the pages of Edgar Rice Burroughs' amazing book. Bless me, Professor. There seems to be someone approaching. Tut, tut, Philander. How often must I tell you that... But I think I am... Mr. Philander, I now find you guilty of a flagrant breach of courtesy in interrupting me to call attention to a mere quadruped of the genus feeling. As I was saying... Heaven, Professor... A lion? Well, if you insist on using slang, yes, a lion. Oh, reprehensible. I shall most certainly report this outrageous breach of ethics to the directors of the adjacent zoological garden. Let's go now. Numa's roar carries to Tarzan as he sits on a low hanging branch watching the hut. It's the roar of a king beast as he crouches. Tawny belly hugging the ground before the steely muscles propel him in terrific force upon his helpless prey. Tarzan springs to his feet. He leans forward, grasps the tough stem of a trailing vine. His knees bend as he pulls the vine toward him. His feet seem to grip the rough bark of the branch. His strong hands work their way down the vine. He crouches like a sprinter at the mark, and with one glance across the clearing, gauges his distance. He tenses, thrusts himself out into space. In a wide swinging arc, he crosses the clearing. He lets go. He flies through the air, 10, 20 feet. His arms reach out. He catches another branch, hangs on, drops again, down, down, down. He sees him a crouch, lips curled back, tiger like sang bared. Cars and feet touch a branch for a brief second. He sees Porter, Philander, straight with terror. They stagger toward a tree. Porter trips. He throws out his arms to catch his balance. He falls. Tarzan, with grace and skill beyond the dreams of any wire walker, runs out the branch. It's only a few feet from the ground. He bends down, drops, catches the branch with his left hand. His right hand shoots out. He grips Porter by the arm, pulls him off the ground. He must be Her ears are almost flat against her head. The greenish yellow eyes gleam viciously. Tarzan lifts Porter to the branch. Satisfied that the professor is hanging on, he reaches for the lander. Numa screams. The lander clutches desperately at the branch. He touches it. The lion is within inches of Tarzan's foot. The ape man feels a hot, pungent breath. The brute's mouth is open. Rasp like tongue pressed hard against gleaming teeth. He snarls. Numa's jaws close with a vicious snap. The coarse, bristling hairs on top of the beast's head brush Tarzan's feet. Tarzan draws his knees up in a level with his chin, swings himself to safety. <laughs> Back in Tarzan's hut, Jane Porter and Clayton are trying to make their jungle home as comfortable as possible. There. <laughs> Take a look at this, Jane. Oh, that's fine. Now I can use the cupboard for our dishes. If tin mugs can be classed as dishes. Well, it isn't much to look at, but it's the first shop I ever made. And I'm quite proud of it. <laughs> At least it won't come down. You know, we are badly in need of something to sleep with. Do you think you could make a long handle broom? Why, yes, yes, I think so. Let me see. Why, I can tie a bunch of these feathery leaves to a reasonably straight branch. Oh, that will be perfect. I can put up with almost anything but these enormous spider webs on the beams and in the corners. <coughs> You know, Cecil, I've been thinking about that warning we found on the door. So have I. Tarzan of the Apes. Who on earth can he be? And why haven't we seen him? Well, as to that, I have no more idea than you have. But what I can't understand is how anyone could live in this hut and not bury the skeletons we found here. It is very strange. I can make nothing of it. That note, signed 
Tarzan of the Apes. It's the most mysterious thing. Uh, by the way, if you have no objection, I would much rather make the petition for your room out of sailcloth. Oh, I have no objection. In fact, I feel that I'm getting altogether too much consideration having a room all to myself. Ah, but that's just it. If I put this sailcloth on some sort of a roller, we can put it down at night, and then in the daytime we'll, we'll still have the same amount of room. Why, I think that's a clever idea. Tell me... Have you ever been shipwrecked before? <laughs> no, no. No, but I'll let you in on a secret. For the first ten years of my life, my sole ambition was to join Robinson Crusoe on his desert island. Well, well, this isn't getting on with the work. Uh, what? The ship. The ship is gone. Gone? Well, there goes our last link with civilization. I, I don't know whether to be glad that those mutineers are gone or to be sorry to see the last of the ship. Well, of course, as long as they were here, our lives were in constant danger. But I suppose we all felt that the ship represented some sort of contact with the outside world. And the treasure... I wonder if they found that. That depends on whether or not Captain Tracy found the map. And if he did, I suppose Young killed him. Oh, no. I know, but I feel responsible. If I hadn't thrown that map overboard... He would all have been killed. And for all we know, Tracy may be right here in the jungle. The jungle. Oh, I do hope Father and Mrs. Philander don't wander too far away. You know, they're as helpless and thoughtless as two children. Oh, I think they're able to look after themselves. And now, Jane, where do you want me to put the clothes, Ray? You know, if the white ants ever get into them, well, it's goodbye clothes. Well, there's really not much choice. I think over here by the bunk is as good a place any, don't you? Then over here by the bunk, it is. What are you going to use for clothes for? Ah, I have that all figured out. Whoever the previous occupants of the hut were, they had a good supply of carpenter's tools. While this floor is a bit rusty, the floor this branch I've selected, and I think when I finish, yes, yes, I'm quite sure I'll have a perfectly good clothes rack. Now, to work. <laughs> Well, your Robinson Crusoe ideas are certainly standing up in good stead. <laughs> I could do a much better job if I had some decent nails. Have you used the ones from the packing case? Yes, yes, I have. But after pulling them out and trying to scrape them on a rough stone, they bend too easily. Well, I think you're doing wonders. Well, I'm not much of a carpenter, but I guess they'll do it. Cool. My, that's warm work, Jane. Uh, yes, yes. What is Look it? Look here. What? Up on this shelf. What? What? So, I'm way up here in this corner. But I didn't know this thing before. Book? Oh, what sort of book? Well, they're, they're so dusty. But this one looks rather like a diary. Tesso. Look. John Clayton. Lamia. Your uncle, Lord Greystoke? Yes. Yeah. But how do you come for these things being here in this savage African jungle? Well, there's, there's only one explanation. Instead of being lost at sea, as we have believed he was, Greystoke died here. I wonder what happened to the famous Greystoke locket. What locket? A diamond-studded locket that has been in the family for generations. It was always presented to the bride of a Greystoke at her wedding ceremony. I'm sorry, Cecil. I'm awfully sorry. There seems to be nothing here but the book. Yes. Yes. Of course. 
coffin. The locket would have been with Lady Greystoke. She was called the beautiful Lady Alice, wasn't she? Yes. I've seen her portrait, you know, in the gallery at the manor. Well, this explains a lot of things and leaves a lot of other things unexplained. Why? What do you mean? I mean, this diary proves conclusively that they were not drowned. What happened to the crew of the vessel? How did Lord and Lady Greystoke come to this place? Were Lord and Lady Greystoke the sole survivors? Or is history repeating itself, as it so often does? Did their crew mutiny and put them ashore? Perhaps the diary will tell us. Oh, well. I'd rather think the famous locket has been worn for the last time by the bride of a graceful. <laughs> Your father's blender. Quick, give me that rifle. Take the other yourself and bar the door. 